So hello everyone, thanks uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name's uh, Brian Duffy, I'm the, the Chief Exec of uh, the Watches of Switzerland Group. And we're uh, really pleased to be doing these uh, Instagram uh, videos at uh, a very exciting uh, time, uh, Watching Wonders, which we're gonna go on and talk about. I'm really pleased to introduce a good friend of, uh, of our business and, uh, uh, and my guest uh, for today, and that's Bill Quinn. Uh, Bill's a writer and editor and uh, honestly, one of the country's true uh, experts when it comes to the wonderful world of uh, uh, of, of mechanical watches, and I uh, look forward to, to hearing your thoughts. And Bill, really nice to see you. Thank you, thank you, Brian. That's very kind of you to say so. It's uh, it's novel seeing each other over our uh, respective corners of the Zoom call. I think yeah. we're very familiar with this process now. I can't imagine the watch CEOs this time last year. We're considering having to launch the 2021 collections in quite this manner. But it, since it started at 7 a.m. this morning, Central European time, it's run very smoothly, the first ever digital-only Watches and Wonders event. And it's been quite beguiling being able to meet the CEOs, virtually at least, and to see the product. And I suppose to, say, to suggest that this is now going to take its place in what will increasingly become an iterative launch process where we'll be meeting up with CEOs and brands, hopefully not forever virtually, but throughout the year, rather than the uh, fairs and uh, events that we used to visit together, Brian, where we really were yep. packed into a few weeks each year where everything was shown to us. And we went, we went away and made of what, what of it we could. So it's been, it's been fascinating. I think it's, a, it's an elevation in terms of how the brands are presenting their product, but it's clearly an evolution as well. I can't see we'll go back to a live event without any form of virtual or digital inclusion for those yeah. who are at home. No, I, I think that's uh, I think that's right, and and I know we both share the view that there's really no substitute for actually somebody passing a product across to you, a prototype, and you're getting a chance to see it on the wrist and and hear someone, whether it's a designer or, or the you know the commercial folks that we deal with, kind of present the actual product and all of its magic. But, there's no substitute for that. But on the other hand, there, there has been a real efficiency out of uh, how products have been sequentially presented, proximity of delivery, you know, fairly quick after the presentation. So hopefully what we get in the future is a nice blend of, uh, you know, the, these uh, these two approaches. Mm, I couldn't agree more, Brian. I, it's interesting. I do recall when, when we did used to sit in front of those beautiful desks in Geneva and we were shown the pieces, it, for the brands themselves, for the for the uh, for the colleagues who work on each individual dial name, they found the process interesting because they were responding to how we responded to the watches. Yep. So, I do feel, although perhaps as a commentator around watches, I feel I'm missing out. I think in some respects the brands probably feel they're missing out as well. And let's not forget, we do like getting together and on occasion having quite a party when we do. So I think we're all yep. sitting this one out, but we're all ready to go back into the room, as they say. Yeah, yeah. So well, and hope that will be a year away, and of course. What was uh, what was planned to have happened uh, was, you know, the first truly global concentrated presentation in in, the, in Geneva in uh, two thousand and twenty. The first one, I think, for over three decades, I would imagine that all the brands were all together. Um, so that didn't happen in twenty. It hasn't happened in twenty one, but it will happen in twenty two. Right? Mm, absolutely. But let's not forget, this is also a very auspicious moment because. Several of the Geneva brands who traditionally showed in Basel um, have now joined their friends in Geneva for the first time. And obviously, yep. we know of whom we speak, but I thought it was interesting that Rolex, who exhibited at Basel and had exhibited since the 30s for their first inaugural, for their, uh, for their inaugural uh, visit to Geneva's Watches and Wonders, chose the same slot, 12 p.m. on the Wednesday, which was traditionally yep. the first moment we ever had to get in front of the pieces themselves back in Basel. And here yep. we are in another city, another date in the diary, in a virtual scenario, but there they are at 12 p.m. sharp on the Wednesday with yep. the first showings of their 2021 collections. Yes, and as ever with surprises, and, uh, mm. and and it always amazes me how a big organisation like Rolex managed to uh, 
uh, uh, to keep uh, so much up their sleeve and, and surprise and delight us on the on the day. And uh, I don't, you're a, you're a veteran of uh, of Basel and uh, SIHH, um, but I can I still remember very clearly only uh, seven years ago my first Basel just walking in and being overwhelmed by the grandeur and the impact of everything, and in particular when you walk down the, uh, that first hall and you saw that enormous building of uh, of Rolex uh, there in, in all of its glory and, and that undoubtedly was the uh, you know a real thrill and concentration for the uh, for the whole visit and once again as you said with the uh, uh, with the remote uh, presentations that they've uh, that they've done today so I mean so let's get on and talk about them. what's your overall impression of what you saw to them today at 12 o'clock on the dot well again I was I was interested to uh see quite how there's now a mini industry isn't there trying to guess what Rolex will do next and I think we were all reading the runes and following the blogs and deciding whether or not we agreed with them but we all pretty much understood that a 50th anniversary wasn't going to go unnoticed by a yep. brand like Rolex so I think we were ready and waiting and excited to see a new explorer too but that is not the talking point of the day yep. funnily enough it's its predecessor the explorer yep. which uh, has now appeared in a 36 millimeter case and for the very first time in what the world calls two-tone or bicolor but of course uh, Rolex called Rolesaur which is a, a combination of 18 karat yellow gold and oyster steel yep. and I think as much as that's going to blow the doors off the, the the Twitterati and the Instagram posters I think what's I suppose the more interesting point for me is that it, it has returned to the original 36 millimeter case size of 1953 and that removes what I consider to be probably the the single most uh what should we say the, the perfect 39 millimeter almost entirely from the classic Rolex collection now I think only the Cellini moon face is now available in a 39 millimeter case so yep. it's interesting to see Rolex move away from something that they've used very powerfully for many years and the 36 now is becoming a very, very regular size in the Rolex Classic Collection. But yeah. um, we could talk more about the piece, Brian. Were you impressed by it? I, I think it looks beautiful. And I, I, I mean, I, I love, you know, the heritage stories of, of uh, adventure and uh, adventure and developments with, with Rolex. And of course, none more so than, uh, than the first exploration of, uh, of Everest that, when it happened. And, I think if I've heard the stories correctly, I think Sherpa Tenzing got his watch at a different time from Edmund Hillary and the, and the rest of the uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. um, but it was their um, experience and advice and commentary and how well the watch had worked that came back and led to the development of the Explorer. So it's a, it's a wonderful story. It really is. And I think I think people can get too can get too obsessed with the detail as to where the watch sat and where it physically went. But I think the overriding impression is that Rolex, rather like Hillary, was using this expedition as an experimentation period as well. And let's not forget that Rolex had been uh, supporting Everest bids since the 30s. So I yeah. think it was almost on the 20th anniversary of their first visit to Everest that a Rolex made it to the top. And I think it's quite interesting to see how, as a result of that, the whole concept of the tool watch and what Rolex now call their professional range or now the classical range is is really started with that explorer model and how that yeah. led to that how that led to the models we know so well today but they're yeah. both very handsome pieces as as i say i think the um the rotosaur uh, variant will will really kick up some dust i think a lot of the rolex uh, aficionados will be discussing long into the night now how they feel about it. There's been a tendency in the past to suggest that tool watches shouldn't be made available in precious metals. I mean, the real hardcore would rather they don't appear on Jubilee bracelets, for instance. So this is another game-changing Rolex moment. It's a disruptive moment where they, Rolex knows that the aficionados will discuss this for, for a long time to come. But the, the non rotosaur variant, the stainless steel with the uh, black lacquer dial, is yep. a beautiful, beautiful piece as well and shouldn't be overlooked. I mean, it's a stunning piece, very similar yes. in all of its attributes to the original 1016. I look forward to seeing it, and uh, and I think they've done something different on the on the air markers, if I understood correctly, with the chromoly effectively how yeah. they've used it. Mm -hmm. The impression I got, and of course, here's a good example of if we haven't actually seen it. 
in the in the flesh. You're not 100 percent sure, but my impression was there was a greater depth to the chromolite that was mm. being used, so to have the same kind of impact that a almost like a sandwich dial would have. Yeah, I think I think I think it's it's commonly held now that Rolex preferred evolution to revolution, as we know, yeah. and um, no model comes to market now without. Um, without subtle, subtle improvements made to um, the technology inside. Obviously, in this case, there's a, uh, a new movement from the movement. There is the, as you mentioned, the chroma light, which has been uh, uh, used more forensically to lengthen the time period in which it remains luminous. I mean, I have to say, I wish I was there and they were dimming the lights and we could see it in all of its deep blue glory, but yeah. that day will come. But yeah, um, yeah it's, it's it's fascinating to see how these uh, small it, small changes build into another addition to the to the legacy that is in this case the Explorer. Yeah. Well, I suppose we should talk about the Explorer too, which is yeah. celebrating the fiftieth anniversary. Yeah. And I suppose you could argue that in this respect, it has undergone possibly more of a overhaul. Um, it remains in this forty-two millimeter stainless steel case. Interestingly, yeah. it doesn't get a serochrome bezel as I think several uh, observers suggested it might do for its anniversary. So it remains yep. in steel. So it's a very, in, in that respect, it's very true to the original 71. But obviously it comes with all of the uh, more recent attributes, which is now obviously a fully functioning GMT second hand. And the case and lugs have been, as we saw last year, have been very subtly re-engineered to improve the overall economics of the piece. But it's, yep. it's, it's a really impressive piece. And I think um, it'll be interesting to see whether it galvanizes the uh, the fans of the Submariner, for instance, to, or the GMT Master too, to come into the Explorer 2 market. Because I think from my perspective, it's something that's been rather, it's a model that's been rather overlooked, I have to say, in recent years. Yeah, no, that's a gorgeous watch. I think it's a, a very recognizable mm. uh, Rolex watch in the 24 hour uh, dial. Um, on the bezel, so I think it looks great. And and I, you know, something that you mentioned, I think, is really important is the uh, the expansion and now almost complete use of the uh, of the new generation of movements that are just mm. so accurate, so robust. I mean, they're, they're huge technical and uh, uh, functional developments. And of course, that now is a uh, now in the whole Explorer collection. So. Mm. Uh, it's going to get a lot of attention. We're going to sell everything, of course, that, uh, that Rolex uh, produces, and we're not going to get enough of it. And, um, you know, the other thing, of course, is that we are, uh, we're only now in March, it was only September, in fact, we're in April, mm. uh, it was only September when a whole range of product was introduced to us that we're still working very hard to catch up with uh, with demand or and now have this uh, this uh, really exciting new collection that we saw today. Mm. But Explorer is going to get a great deal of attention. Um, and uh, so what, what next? Well, I think I think we have to talk about the date just, which again is in, in is is in a, is now in what appears to be almost a universal case size of 36 millimeter, not too big, not too small, very popular. I personally prefer the 36 millimeter Rolex to all others. And we saw some interesting dials last year, didn't we, in the uh, in the new Oyster Perpetual range, which um, I think was a blast of sunshine and sunlight. I mean, vivid green, yellow and pink, red dials, um, which really brought not only Rolex's collection alive late last year, but I think the whole world alive when they saw them. It yep. woke everyone up. And there, there is, of course, a, a strong history in Rolex of or developing very striking dials. It's something they've yeah. always been renowned for. But I ha perhaps because the focus for many years in terms of collector markets has been more towards the vintage tool watches, you could be under the impression that a Rolex comes available in a, in a black lacquer or maybe a white polar dial. But that's yeah. not the case. In, in, in this instance, the, uh, the, uh, the models that we're looking at today come with a variant of dials, which are very interesting. Again, there's a choice of colors um, and obviously three uh, case material choices as well. But what's really vivid is the, the, the dials themselves, one of which comes in the patina of a palm, um, yep. depicted in an extraordinary olive green, the color of the year already, I think, green. And yep. another is a very interesting dial, which has been created in reference to the fluted designs of the bezels yeah. of many of Rolex's watches. So we, we we understand and we appreciate everything Rolex does in terms of, you said, its engineering and its efficiency, its robust and uh, uh, long-term uh, 
survivability. But what we're looking at now is just great design and great, great executions of design as well. So yep. again, I think these are watches that will have people talking. I think what's subtly communicated through these, uh, certainly through the palm dial is quite how much work Rolex organization is doing away from the Rolex watch brand business in terms of philanthropy, sorry, philanthropy, sustainability. And in this instance, I think it's quietly reflecting on its commitment to the environment and the perpetual planet um, initiative it launched uh, in 2018, 19. So I think these are very clever dials. I think the watches look stunning. I think they'll be yeah. very, again, I think they'll, there's, there's a really solid market. And um, I think the date just is just a very, very wearable watch. Yep. And uh, it sounds like uh, listening to you, the Green Palm, your favourite? I think so. I just think it's such a clever iteration. I mean, I, I, I love the, the, the bold, solid colours of last year, but this is, this is yep. interesting. This is a very subtle uh, twist on that. Yep. And dials, as we know, dials can kind of... <laughs> Dials can divide, but dials also bring people together. And at the moment, I think there's a real fascination with uh, with um, what some people will call extraterrestrial steel, but it's in fact yep. meteorite um, yep. formed over millions and millions of years. And uh, as it slowly tra traverses the universe and then promptly lands on Mother Earth, yep. uh, where enterprising watchmakers now are um, been taking it and slicing it incredibly thin. And producing these wonderful dials and i think rolex since they started doing this with the date just and and the daytona has really made the meteorite dial its own i mean I've, yeah. I've new iteration particularly in the white gold on the oyster flex daytona. i'm looking at i'm looking at it right now uh, to me it yeah. was the real standout it worked so yeah. well um that's what a silver uh, meteor dial against the black sub dials it looks stunning mm -hmm. and uh, I, I now have the personal dilemma because i have that watch and I, I love it very much but i think this looks you know e even of course everything you you see you get excited about but this is this is a mm. this is stunning on the detona yeah yeah i think sorry to go on about it but to be able to hold that white gold in the hand i mean just to feel the heft of that piece with yeah the would be very special yeah. so I, th I think that's a really impressive piece that they've brought out again this year it's yeah. uh, it's stunning and I, I think you're right too and um you know, bringing attention to to subjects of uh, of the environment, and sustainability, and so on, and and the great work of Rolex doesn't go out and mm. and, uh, and and promote and publicise all of what they do, but they're doing uh, great work in areas of exploration, sustainability, and just generally attracting attention to a mm. to the subject is something that uh, uh, that we all should applaud. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So uh, quite a few things happening on the on the Daytona. Some uh, some exciting developments in the gold options. Mm, I think we have. I, I, yeah, the white, yellow, and Everose gold are, are the three um, iterations this year. Yep. And as I said, I think that the um, the oyster flex, which we have seen before, I think visiting the um, the white gold gives it a real sort of lift because it plays off the black of the dial as well. So there's an interesting there's an interesting. Uh, dynamic isn't there between what we consider to be tool watches that can be made dressier by the change of dial or perhaps the change of bracelet and then slightly dressier watches which are given a slightly more harder look by given a different outlook and I think yep. the genius of Rolex in many ways is the way that it does sort of bridge this divide between something that's very classic looking but also very classy as well it never seems to sit away from where you'd expect to see it and yep. I think we, we could we could come on and talk a little bit about the Sky Dweller, which I know has also been released. And I think um, that's a wonderful watch. As we know, it's the most complicated piece Rolex manufactured yep. featuring this incredible uh, annual calendar and um, uh, uh, world time uh, in a very, very sophisticated mechanism that is deployed simply by rotating the bezel or, or the yep. crown. I mean, it's a very subtle, very, very stealth clever watch and yep. it's now been granted the uh um with some jubilation no pun intended the jubilee bracelet which has yep. been coming into the range um in over recent years so i think there has been this sort of uh interesting swapping out of certain elements that give a watch a dressier feel or a slightly more tool a professional feel and um, they seem to what Rolex seem to do very well is to decide what goes with what when, and then of course create some discussion along the way as whether people feel that particular accessory, that item, belongs on the, on the watch or not. But um, yeah. it's, it's maybe it's, I'm 
I often, you know, when I, whenever commenting on, you know, the, the Rolex, you know, see where the trends are headed and respond, or does Rolex create the trends? And, and I, I'm mm-hmm. for sure it's the latter. Um, I, I think that um, they, they, within their own understanding of their aesthetic and, and their following uh, overall, they, they clearly know what to do. And whatever it is that they do, we always think, yes, of course, does it, doesn't that make wonderful sense? And, I think yeah. Skydwell is a great example. You know, it was only available in 18 karat gold before, mm-hmm. and this wonderful complication was a bit of a secret because of the price point. Then you do it in steel, and the message gets out, and everybody gets very correctly excited about it, and mm-hmm. it's available to a much broader audience. And now they come back doing, you know, some some other really, you know, exciting developments around the uh, around color and, as you say, different bra- bracelet types. Mm-hmm. So it's now become a, a pretty serious part of the collection. Definitely, but at, and at the same time, they are they are rewarding those who perhaps do loiter on the more traditional side of the equation, shall we say? And I know your colleague yeah. Mark's delighted to see that the GMT Master Two is now on an oyster in stainless steel is on an oyster yes. bracelet. So, yeah. really, as you mentioned earlier, I think supply is the only issue here. I think the desirability speaks for itself, and yeah. I always I always reflect on the fact that what Rolex are putting into their watches in terms of their movement upgrades are the sort of things that some other brands would consider to be their selling point. But for Rolex, yep. nothing, no one single element of a Rolex is its selling point. And it yep. really does bring home quite how, how specific and how uh, clever their product development is, is that it's the overall product that we admire. It's the overall product that we wish to own. We're not drawn specifically by any one quality or one selling point. And I yep. suppose that's what makes Rolex Rolex. There's there's so much choice this year that you really and you wouldn't be disappointed with any of the Rolex pieces that you would be able to um, buy. But in in each category, almost there is a there's a there's a sense that there, there's the ever changing, never changing world of Rolex, which is where yep. everything is subtly improved. Yep, and I, and it's why again we have we have so many and increasing numbers of uh, of Rolex collectors because you, you do become so impressed by and drawn in by the brand, then you inevitably, we're obviously in a, in a privileged position of seeing and understanding everything that's there, but uh, you inevitably are just drawn to say, I must have that piece, I must have this piece. And, uh, and we know from our experience that are more and more people are becoming you know, serious Rolex collectors and really getting to, to know and love this brand so well. Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting point, as much as that uh, on the way into this event, people have been talking about what they may see, what may happen. As we leave this event, people are already talking about what they didn't see and what they yeah. expected to happen. So uh, one conversation I was following was around, was around the Air King, which uh, um, several commentators felt was perhaps going to be retired to make way for a, an Explorer 2. But there's been no announcement on that. So Rolex's real, real skill is to keep everyone guessing. Yeah. And then producing the product and then hitting the product into the stores. And you, yeah. you know, Brian, the demand follows the attention that this brand gets. It's just yeah. phenomenal. No, I'm sure. And uh, what do you think of the gem set pieces? Some really exciting things there. Well, again, I wouldn't like to use the word overlook because that's not true. But I think the way that Rolex does its gem setting, I mean, the way it does its diamond setting, the, the, the decoration, the decorated pieces are superlative, as, as we always know they will be. Um, there's... There is, uh, there is a discussion afoot now as to where decorated watches sit in the marketplace from a gender uh, uh, perspective. But it's interesting that there's, there was no demarcation when Rolex launched the, uh, the, the first um, decorated piece we saw, that it was basically a beautiful, beautiful watch for those that yeah. enjoy fine gem setting. Yeah, and I mean, I, again, I can confirm huge demand from collectors and uh, and and new consumers for uh, uh, for these mm. um, uh, for these pieces, and I think there's going to be a lot of excitement about the uh, uh, about the gems the pieces mm. that, are, uh, that are being introduced. I think the the Wildcat has been a just wonderful design, with yeah. great demand and following, and we've two new products on that. And of course, I think the star of the show was the uh, the bejeweled Sky Dweller that we've just been talking about. Yeah. Yeah, um, one of which the, the fully paved version, uh, we don't even have a price for at this point yet because of the, they're still adding up the cost of the uh, the huge number of diamonds that were involved. Yeah, um, I, I, it's, it's a nice problem to have. Um, but yes, um, setting the value when you are negotiating with quite so many 
uh, hundreds of individual stones is probably something you want to take some time over doing and getting it right the first time is my thought. Yep. But, uh, um, it'll be very, it'll be fascinating to see um, all of these pieces in the flesh, obviously, but it will also be interesting to see which become the standout um, above the line crazy makers. And I think in this instance, my money my money is on the um, the Rolosaur Explorer because it's so unusual. I think the uh, the stainless steel variant is possibly the more traditionally focused and will have a huge, huge ready market. Yep. But the Explorer 2 is it shouldn't uh, 50th anniversary. <laughs> it's interesting. Some commentators feel anniversaries are, are simply a marketing device. They're just a tool by which brands uh, create focus. I think they run deeper than that. I think there are moments when brands really reset the storylines around their pieces and reset the concept of the provenance that has led to the latest designs. I think anniversaries are very, very important moments for brands. And I think the yeah. Explorer 2, because it holds so much of the originals, um, tool watch fa fabulousness you know it was a very very solid piece let's not forget it was designed really for the for the extreme sportsmen of the age of the 70s i don't think the term extreme sports had really been born then but yeah. the idea you were producing a watch for cave dwellers and uh, and uh, those that spend long long months in the dark or light arctic and don't know whether it's day or night and need to look at their watch to find out i mean this yeah. is a very 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 stubborn sort of timepiece that has now found its setting in the 2021 i think it's yeah. extraordinary yeah and again the the, the, um, the updates are very very subtle because the rolex are very uh, keen to present to us today that the, the, the watch really is perfect for, for what it stands for and, and what it does and it really didn't need a lot of attention and they, they never feel that need when they when when they see a product working so well yeah. Uh, and I think a really interesting point looking at the collection overall that you made earlier, the um, uh, the focus on the 36 millimeter. It's now it's a unisex size uh, overall. Um, it's a it's a big concentration for Rolex now, and, and uh, so much development and activity around that size. I think it's going to be a it's going to be very interesting. So well, I know from our conversations, Brian, that you spend a, a great deal of time. Uh, looking at trends and, and recognizing where they may go next and um i think we've discussed overall case sizes and whether they're going up or down it seems to me that rolex now have a have a very very healthy portfolio of case sizes yep. I, I i i could concern myself that the 39 seems to be disappearing but the fact is they now have they run the gamut from the 28 and without going into the larger professional pieces i think the 42 millimeter explorer 2 just seems to be absolutely the perfect stages yep. watch for this year yep. if one can find yep. one let's hope we yep. can no, I'd, I'd agree with that in the same way that the 42 york master last year created such a uh, such a following and uh, an impact so overall how would you you'd summarize it as being a has been a great collection or what would be your overall well I, I brian i think you really hit the nail on the head there i mean we we waited until september last year to to see the 2020 collection here we are in april and already the 2021 so i think it's a continuation in a in in, in some instances it's part of a conversation that was probably planned to start slightly earlier in 2020 as we know came came alive in september we are now rejoining the conversation in 21 and who knows let's hope maybe there's some more secrets to be unveiled later in the year i do think that now that watches and wonders is operating in this format and so many brands have chosen to use this format that it may actually become part of a wider and a longer term rollout yeah. of watch pieces because i think that would really make our lives so much more entertaining if we knew that maybe in three or four months time we may be seeing something else with rolex you can never say i mean it's yep. unlikely in the extreme but we can only hope yeah well bill it's uh, always a great pleasure to listen to your very articulate and informed uh, uh, take in what you've seen me i mean honestly i mean it one of the, the country's true experts when it comes to uh, watches and thank you for, so much for helping us interpret and uh, uh, and present what's uh, happening at watch and uh, wonder so it's been a real pleasure to chat to you brian thank you so much for those kind words and i look forward to seeing you in real life as we say but until then enjoy the rest of watches and wonders okay thank you